Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. This is our uh, second in the Sex in the City series for the City Talks. Um, I'll start with the territory acknowledgement. So most of us, including myself, are visitors on unceded Coast Salish uh, territory of the Lekwungen peoples. Um, I'm Simon Springer. I'm part of the Urban Studies Committee at UVic. I'm also in the Department of Geography there. Um, in terms of the city talks themselves, we have generous funding from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the EU Centre for Excellence, uh, UVic Faculty of Social Science chips in, as does the Geography Department at UVic as well. Um, tonight, I'm very happy to um, welcome and introduce Dr. Annalie Lepp. She is an Associate Professor uh, in Gender Studies at UVic. Um, Annalie has a PhD in history from Queen's University uh, with research interests spanning from gender, domestic violence, trafficking in, person, in persons um, with a transnational focus as well. Um, Annalie is co-founder and current director of the Canadian branch of the Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women, uh, which is headquartered in Bangkok, I believe. Um, Dr. Lepp has been recognized as an excellent educator. Uh, awards include the Harry Hickman Alumni Award for Excellence in Teaching, Faculty of Humanities uh, Teaching and Excellence Award, and also UVic uh, President's uh, Extraordinary Service Award as well. Um, Annalie is probably best known for a lot of publications, pro probably best known for uh, the work Dismembering the fam Family, Marital Breakdown, Domestic Conflict, and Family Violence in Ontario, 1830 to 1920, which was published by the University of Toronto Press. So thanks very much for being here, Emily. Thanks. Thank you for having me. I love this weird timing. Yeah. I have this weird timer on my slideshow. That's why I didn't start it right from the start, because it ticks away. Working? Oh no, going back. Okay, so thanks for having me and thanks for coming out on a cold wintry night. I was worried last night that uh, the snow would deter all of this from happening, but uh, gratefully I think it's starting to melt even though it's fairly cold. Can you hear me? I should move the mic. Um, so I was asked to do this late in the game. I know that Dr. Natalie Oswin from the Department of Geography from McGill University was going to be here, but um, I was happily stepped in to make sure that this talk could happen tonight. And what I was gonna do is discuss the Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women. I'm gonna refer to it as GetW. And it's recently re uh, released seven country stu study that's entitled Sex Worker Organizing for Change, Self-Representation, Community Mobilization, and Working Conditions. Um, and working conditions also including elements commonly associated with trafficking. So what I'm going to do in this talk is provide a little bit of overview of why the relationship between sex work and trafficking is such a contentious issue, some of the debates. I'll also talk a little bit about GetW's work and why it was that it decided, that the organization decided to undertake the seven country study on sex worker organizing and share some of the key findings of our report. It's a very large report. I just wanted to show it to you as my show and tell, but it's a big report, seven, seven countries, and um, including Canada, and I wrote that ch particular chapter. So, just a little bit about the debate. The relationship with sex work and human trafficking it remains one of the most contentious issues both in the sex work world and also in the trafficking world. There are some who view sex work as inherently exploitative and coercive and therefore see, and they, the main focus here is on women, cisgendered women in particular, there's less attention to uh, male sex workers and trans sex workers in this debate. Um, who work in the industry, so they, they, they define anyone who's working in the d industry that is a cisgendered woman as a trafficking victim, regardless of their consent or conditions of labor. And this group, we call them prohibitionists mainly, the prohib prohibitionists support some form of a criminalized model, that the sex industry needs to be criminalized. 
Some advocate for full criminalization. Some advocate for certain aspects of the industry to be uh, criminalized. But the most popular model right now is called partial criminalization, or what is known as the end-demand model. And this has become very popular in Europe and in other countries as well. And basically, the end-demand model means that you, you decriminalize the sex workers. The sex workers are victims, so they are decriminalized. They should not be criminalized. But you criminalize everything else. You criminalize the clients. You criminalize third parties. And the ultimate goal of all of this is to eradicate the sex industry. And this particular model was enacted in Canada in 1914, uh, 1914, 2014. It has also been enacted in Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Iceland, and sometimes called the Nordic model. And there are other countries of the world that are also, also adopting it. There are others, however, who argue that sex, um, and this includes sex workers' advocates, argue that sex work is a livelihood strategy. And that like other work, in the informal sector, and here we're talking about the informal sector that's unregulated, um, but in many respects, a sex work is also stigmatized, but other, other forms of work in the informal se sector, um, and is sometimes performed under exploitative conditions. So this is the argument that says that it's a livelihood strategy, and like other work in the informal sector, can, uh, can happen under exploitative conditions. This particular group, uh, and this includes Amnesty International, for example, that came out in favor of decriminalization in 1915. Many major international health agencies propose the decriminalization of sex work and that there needs to be more attention paid to harm reduction, labor rights, and working, uh, working conditions. And GATW, the organization that I work with in Bangkok, and I'll talk a little bit more about GATW, also support sex workers' rights and the decriminalization of the sex industry. So in many respects, GATW is in, in this weird position insofar as it's an anti-trafficking organization but supports decriminalization and sex workers' rights. So the UN Trafficking in Persons Protocol, um, which was adopted in 2000, is the instrument that governs trafficking internationally. And the UN protocol is situated within a border security and law and order enforcement regimes. Um, so it's not located within a human rights framework. It's not a human rights document by any stretch of the imagination. It's fully situated within border security and law enforcement. But the UN protocol makes very clear that trafficking and sex work are distinct phenomena and that trafficking and forced labor occur also in a range of economic sectors. So trafficking does not only just happen in the sex industry, even though it's often the main focus, um, it can happen in any labor sector. So in practice, even though the UN trafficking protocol makes this distinction, trafficking into sex work has received disproportionate attention from the media, from NGOs and policymakers, and trafficking and sex work, as I indicated in the first level of debate, sex work and trafficking are often conflated. Furthermore, the ways in which anti-trafficking policies, according to uh, GATW and others, and certainly supported by a report, the way in which anti-trafficking policies have been enforced have often done more harm than good. For example, one of the favorite strategies of anti-trafficking organizations is raid and rescue operations of sex establishments, which often results in the dislocation of sex workers, it often results in detention and deportation of migrant sex workers, it often uh, results in no assistance to trafficked persons because the protocol doesn't require state governments to provide any sort of form of uh, uh, assistance, it often results in rehabilitation programs that function as extrajudicial detention with women being held against their will in, det in detention and rehabilitation centers, often with little food and so forth, and sometimes risk their lives while trying to escape these, um, these re rehabilitation centers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. In addition, the project of combating tra trafficking has also been used by state governments in the name of protecting women and children. It's very protective in that way, not only as an instrument to further anti-sex work uh, and criminalization agendas, because in order to, if you want to eradicate trafficking, you eradicate the sex industry. 
they don't say there's trafficking into the fishing industry in Thailand that we should close down the fishing industry. Or that there's child labor in the agricultural industry in India, nobody's saying we need to stop producing food. But it's only in the sex industry where the eradication of trafficking is associated with um, the eradication of the industry. But, so it's, it does have a very, very strong anti-sex work agenda. But it also has been used by state governments to further an anti-migration agenda. The argument is if you stop, stop the flow of migration, particularly women migration, then you'll eradicate trafficking. So, for example, in Nepal, they passed a law that women under, um, under the age of 30 cannot go to the Gulf states to work as domestic workers. So a protective policy. We will only allow Nepalese women who are 30 years and older to go uh, to the Gulf states to work as domestic workers. But what happens is the women want to work as domestic workers and then they use underground mechanisms to uh, get to their destination. And once you're underground, then the, the possibilities of exploitation increase incrementally. So this argument about stopping the flow of migration and then you're going to eradicate trafficking also does not take into account the root causes of migration and that the fact that people will resort to clandestine methods to migrate. I should have written my slides up. Sorry about this. So, by way of context, um, according to the international definition of human trafficking contained in the UN Trafficking in Persons Protocol, human trafficking, regardless of what the labor sector is, involves three elements. First, and this is according to the definition that 163 countries have agreed to. So the first element is a set of actions with, which involve recruiting and moving someone. So it's a, the, the process of recruiting or moving someone. And the second is the means by which those actions are carried out. So you move or recruit someone through the use of deception, through the use of coercion, through the use of uh, threats, for example. And trafficking as an end purpose has an end purpose. It has an end purpose and that's forced labor or servitude. So these are the three elements so that if, for example, a trafficking case goes forward to the courts, then these three elements need to be present. For youth or children under the age of 18, the second does not apply. So simply the act of recruiting or moving someone into a situation of forced labor doesn't require threats or deception or anything else would constitute trafficking. So trafficking is very different from smuggling, and we hear a lot about smuggling, particularly um, when we're looking at the migration crisis in the Mediterranean, when we're looking at the, um, the, the, the crisis of Rohingya going to Bangladesh, but particularly in the Mediterranean right now, smuggling and trafficking are very different, even though they are interlinked in the sense that somebody can be smuggled and also find themselves in a trafficking situation. But smuggling is really that you make a contractual arrangement with a smuggler that says, I want to go from here to there. You, there's, you, there's a fee, and the fees are very, very high. And, once the, and then the smuggler will take you across uh, international borders. The harder it is to cross international borders, the higher the price. And then um, you, the, you need to pay up the, the fees uh, uh, that, that has been set by the smuggler. Oftentimes people are smuggled and then they find themselves in debt, um, debt bondage in some respects, so they have to repay that, that debt. And so that can often lead into forced labor situations. But these are very different processes under international law, and, um, but oftentimes smuggling and trafficking are collapsed and used as if it was the same thing. So, I just wanted to say a little bit about GATW. Uh, I'm a founding member of GATW Canada, as was already said. So GATW was established at a migration conference, actually, in 1994, and is currently an alliance of about 80 uh, to 100, right now at 80, but it fluctuates organizations located in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and North America. The member organizations include migrant rights organizations, self-organized groups of migrant workers, 
domestic workers, sex workers, survivors of trafficking, and also um, human rights organizations. GATW also has special consultative status uh, to the UN Nation, uh, United Nations Economic and Social Council. So right now, I'm really involved with GATW. I'm on the International Board of Directors. I sit on the Research Advisory Working Group and its Communications Advisory Group. I'm also on the Board of Peers here in Victoria, and I'm in, on the editorial board um, of the Anti-Trafficking Review. So, in September 2015, I facilitated a five-day GATW strategic planning meeting in Bangkok. And really what this planning meeting was about was to reassess where we're at, what are our goals in the next five years. But there was a lot of focus on, the glo on global migration trends of labor, of irregular migrants, of um, undocumented migrants and also in the context of the refugee crises that we're seeing unfolding in the world today, particularly in Southeast and Southern Asia, Europe, and other areas of the world. So the purpose was, again, to identify the Alliance's priorities in the area of research, political, and uh, policy advocacy, and also frontline work in uh, the trafficking migration labor continuum over the next five years and also an articulation of how the Alliance differs from other anti-trafficking and migrant rights organizations, especially, and this is um, really important, especially as the available spaces for political engagement and ad advocacy in the field of refugee and migrant rights is really shrinking. For example, at the international level, at the UN level, the spaces for civil society organizations to be able to have put input on policy and decision making at that level, which used to be the case where uh, civil right, uh, nonprofit organizations or um, civil society organizations would try to lobby, um, those spaces are closing very, very quickly. And, um, and there are also the spaces are closing at the nation state level. So one of the things that makes GATW unique in the global arena is that it is a migrant rights and anti-trafficking organization that has consistently advocated for migrant justice approach. And this is situated very much in a fairly nuanced analysis of the root causes of mobility and displacement in the world today and the need and desire of migrants to enhance opportunities. So if we're talking about root causes, we're talking here about the forces of neocolonialism or predatory capitalism in its globalized form, which has resulted in the destruction of livelihoods and environmental de degradation, rising up levels of poverty in much of the world, a crisis of human insecurity, dispossession, displacement, and deepening inequalities within nations and between nations. And there are various forces that have been well documented, such as resource extraction, agribusiness, land grabbing and water crises, environmental degradation, civil conflicts, war and militarism, have all produced and uh, are producing uprooted, surplus, disposable, and often stateless populations and laborers on the move. And according to some, uh, I have a colleague, um, Jyoti Sanghera at the UNHCR, she says this is the highest level of human displacement we've ever seen on record. According to the UNHCR in 2016, 34,000 people were forcibly displaced every day and 24 people are driven out of their homes every minute. As Saskia Sassen argued in 2016, and you'll be familiar with this, because I made you write a paper on it, in the global south, extreme violence and wards, dead land and waterways due to foreign mining, land and water grabs, plantation, biofuels, the whole climate change, has resulted in the massive loss of habitat and have created new drivers of migration under very extreme conditions and populations that in, are in search of, of a, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, of a bear life, right. not a better life. It's not a better life, it's a bear life. And I think that oftentimes governments in the global north in particular, um, they think that sending asylum seekers and economic and climate refugees back is the solution to this issue. But um, 
said, it, it, you know, it's a very favorite strategy, but it's not an option. And I quote Susan here, quote, what was once a home is now a war zone, a new private gated community, a corporate complex, a plantation, poisoned land, a mining development, a desert, a flooded plain, and a space of uh, oppression and abuse. So there are the, these new drivers of migration of uprooted populations who can't go back for they, where they came from because going back is not an option. But there are other migrant populations that are seeking uh, a better life, enhanced opportunities and sources of livelihood. And migrant workers are actually critical to the survival of, um, of economies and are, in fact are integral to globalization. They're a source of cheap labor in receiving countries or as a source of remittances to sending countries. Um, for example, uh, right now remittances, I think that at last count, are $500 billion a year. So according to statistics released by the UN in 2017, the global migrant population has been growing in the millions each year since 1975, reaching now uh, 258 million people. And that's a 45% increase since 2000, of which 50% are women. And the women working on in various sectors, including agriculture, <laughs> manufacturing, as well as informal and unregulated sectors of the economy in the service industry, domestic work, and sex work. As Jyoti Singera, again, in the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has noted, if all of those 258 million migrants were huddled together in one place, they would constitute the fifth largest country on the planet. So to be a migrant with extreme vulnerability, and Jyoti quotes this because she does a lot of country studies where the, the UN goes to refugee camps and so forth, but one woman said to be a migrant with extreme vulnerability and precarity is to experience a per permanent condition of being in pain and to experience extreme forms of disposability. So GATW looks at this situation and further maintains, well, okay, what has been the response of nation states to this particular situation in the world? What appears, it's, it's almost as if human displacement and populations movements are no longer governable. A country that sets up a fence and people find a different way, right? It's ungovernable. It's, it, and so, but the response has been, one, impose increasingly fortress-like border controls and manage, Im manage immigration policies, and we see this in the global north. The second is to engage in the warehousing of populations in refugee camps or detention centers. I just showed my class a film about Nauru Island and Australia's offshore detention center, and I think I traumatized the class, quite frankly, because the conditions are so deplorable and the situation is so awful. Um, but, you know, Australia completely justifies this policy on the basis that it stopped the boats and it stopped people from drowning at sea. And that's their justification. They don't talk about racism, they don't talk about xenophobia, but they talk about that they stopped the boats. And so then most of the refugees are stuck in Indonesia where they can't work either. Nobody wants them. And, we, and if we remember the Rohingya in a couple of years ago on their boats and they were floating in the Adaman Sea, I think, for four months until uh, a country says, okay, we'll take you because, you know, they, there were, sorry, there were planes, you know, that would drop food and so on and so forth, but they were just floating and no, and it was sort of this crisis and nobody wanted them. So um, there are prisons, detention centers, and all of this in name of national security and the pre preservation of national identities. We saw that in Eastern Europe. And what many argue is that these um, detention centers or offshore detention centers or refugee camps or, and so forth, these have become zones of exceptionalism where the rule of law does not exist. People can be treated in any way, but there is no oversight of how they're treated. So there are these zones of exceptionalism. And the third, I think, consequence is to really harden the hierarchies between citizen and non-citizen, between the deserving and the undeserving, refugee, economic migrant, legal, illegal, smuggled traffic. These are administrative and legal categories 
um, and you have differential access to human humanity and to rights based on with where you're classified in these categories. At the same time, for the refugee, the asylum seeker, the migrant, they don't care about these categories. They simply want to either access a better life or a better life. But I think the key thing here is to understand smuggling and trafficking is that these fortress-like border controls create the material conditions in which migrants, including migrant sex workers, rely on third parties to facilitate cross-border movements. And there's a growing market for clandestine migration services such as irregular labor services, smuggling, provision of false passports, and visa permits, underground traveling, travel operations, and also trafficking. And what these operations are doing, they're capitalizing on the desire or the need amongst a significant proportion of the world's population to move, to migrate. So under globalization, capital can move freely across borders and find, you know, capital investments, stroke of a key, and you can invest in whatever you want. But most people, if most people, especially if they're marked in some way, cannot. And I think that we also have to remember that people who migrate under facil facilitated or irregular or illegal conditions can incur significant monetary costs during their journey, as I said about smuggling, and sometimes really extreme physical ris risks, and we've seen this, of course, in the Mediterranean. And upon their arrival in countries of destination, they often live a life on the margins as irregular or undocumented migrants. And if they're caught by state officials, they are usually detained, warehoused, and deported, regardless of their circumstances. So that was our strategic planning meeting as we were reviewing uh, the, the global situation. So within this context, GATW and its member organizations promote and defend the human rights of all migrants and their families in an increasingly globalized labor market and call for safety standards for migrant workers in the process of migration and in, an, in the informal and formal work sectors, whether that's garment and food pro, garment work, food processing, agriculture, farming, domestic work, sex work, or any sector in which migrant workers work and in which forced labor conditions and practices exist. And, um, and I think that, and GATW also seeks to center how labor migration reflects migrants, including women migrants, needs, aspirations, and capabilities. I think another uh, really important, because I think in the trafficking world and in many anti-trafficking organizations um, don't do this, I think that the, one of the key things that GATW does is to allow and respect the ability of migrants to define their own experiences rather than having an NGO or a COP or a state, an immigration official define them for you. And to define their own experiences and all their complexity and this includes domestic workers. For example, GetW has done a lot of work with Bangladesh and Nepali uh, women who have gone to the Gulf countries to work as domestics. And it also includes migrant sex workers whose experiences are often defined by state officials, NGOs, movie directors, or whatever, calling them victims and sex slaves and all of these stigmatizing terms. So in many respects, this principle rejects the paternalistic impulse of what is often described as the rescue industry or rescue work, which is particularly prevalent in um, the anti-sex work trafficking world. So again, that W is, it, it, it's really about being attentive to people's stories and the complexities of their transnational, regional, and domestic movements into multiple sectors and, and also listening to their hopes for the future. And I think that sometimes um, that gets lost in all of this, that people actually have aspirations and needs and hopes for the future. And to promote respect for their ability to make decisions about or to articulate their desires for the future rather than they, assuming that they don't have the, the ability to do so or that state officials, NGO, service providers know what's best for them. The final 
uh, sort of thing about, not the final thing about Cat W, but the final in this particular arena um, is a related pr principle that Cat W really, really mm -hmm. highly values organizing. They really value that groups self-organize and organize. And this stems from the belief that women and people are experts of their own lives and that the path to meaningful, inclusive, and sustainable social change is, a, is enabled by creating spaces for women and people to voice their concerns, take collective action against injustice, and participate in political and social life. I'm just checking the time. I think I won't show my film. Maybe I'll do it during the questions. That's us. We have members con congresses every uh, few years, and this is the 20th anniversary of Get W, and so we meet and talk for usually over, we usually have a conference, and then we do uh, <coughs> Get W business for a couple of days. And these are the, the sort of, and right here in this is Vandana. She's the, the international coordinator. I think that GATW is also unique in the anti-trafficking landscape because of its very, very strong commitment to accountability. And it's a do no harm approach in the, in, in the development of anti-trafficking policies, strategies, and cam campaigns. And this applies to both governments and NGOs. And what this means is that the ends do not justify the means in the efforts to combat human trafficking. Rather, the principle requires that governments, enforcement, and NGOs seriously consider the possible harmful effects of particular anti-trafficking strategies, interventions, and campaigns. So GATW has engaged consistently in a fairly strong critique of state and most NGO-sponsored anti-trafficking measures, strategies, and campaigns, and the harms committed in the name of anti-trafficking or the name of combating anti-trafficking. Um, and for example, in 2007, GATW released a report entitled Collateral Damage, the Impact of Anti-Trafficking Measures on Human Rights Around the World. And in assessing tra uh, transnational trafficking measures in these eight countries, the researchers concluded that, and I quote here, despite the investments of many hundreds of millions of dollars and probably hundreds of billions of dollars by now, in an effort to eradicate trafficking in persons globally, and despite the good intentions of countless non-governmental organizations working on the issue in most regions of the world, there is substantial evidence to su suggest that anti-trafficking measures have had an unacceptably negative consequences for marginalized categories of people, such as migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, and that these measures, often implemented in the name of protection or rescue, have been counterproductive for the very people they're supposed to benefit most directly, including sex workers. So those were strong words, and collateral damage, you know, does ha has had some influence uh, globally, but at the same time, it was really looking critically at what um, anti-trafficking measures were doing. And what the report does is it outlines a number of principles for limiting the unacceptable side of anti-trafficking measures. Again, often, implemented in the name of protection or rescue of those identified as at-risk groups, and really emphasizing the principle of accountability at all levels, in the state, in the NGO world. Um, and, and this particularly applies to the commercial sex sector that has been and continues to be the principal focus of anti-trafficking interventions. And the final thing, GATW is very, very um, highly critical critical of the way in which trafficking is often utilized as a mechanism to present really graphic and sensationalized stories associated with human trafficking, especially in the context of the sex industry. And this is perpetuated in the media, it's perpetuated in films, by Hollywood celebrities, by governments, and by some NGOs. All right. So it's a two-pronged approach. The first is critiquing the anti-trafficking framework from within and really promoting human rights and justice, 
delaying trafficking and sex work and lobbying for uh, organized sex workers and migrant workers to be consulted in the development of anti-trafficking legislation and sex workers are never <coughs> consulted. And looking at trafficking and as, as an issue of migration for labor and highlighting people's stories of courage, struggle, and resistance in an unjust and exploitative world in which trafficking is not an aberration, but is embedded in the global economy. So now to the study. So this, kind, this was, the study was called Sex Worker Organizing for Change, Self-Representation, Community Mobilization and Working Conditions. It just came out this month. And it was a seven country study on the role of sex worker organizing in enhancing sex workers' ability to live and work in safety and dignity, and their work in addressing ex exploitative and abusive working conditions in that industry. And this study actually built on the collateral damage report that I mentioned from 2007 that documented the negative impacts of anti-trafficking measures on human rights, um, especially those of migrants and sex workers, without pr protecting them from exploitation. And 10 years later, we thought maybe we should check in and see if, if things are the same as they were in 2007. The second, I think, is that sex worker organizations Sex worker organizations are often vilified by anti-trafficking organizations as pimps and traffickers. There, you know, there's a lot of words that are sent towards sex worker organizations. And they're also ignored and marginalized by trade unions. And they're excluded from having a voice in the development of laws and policies that most affect their lives. Whether it's criminal law, whether it's anti-trafficking law, or whether it's the practices of the state, of law enforcement, and so forth. So the second purpose was to document a different approach to anti-trafficking work in the sex industry, one that treats sex workers not as victims, but as partners in efforts to combat exploitative labor practices in the industry. The third purpose was, um, given the high value that GAPW places on organizing, the research documented how self-organizing benefits sex workers specifically and how organized sex workers address rights violations in, um, that their peers are experiencing in the industry, including situations commonly associated with trafficking. So each researcher of each of these countries and um, each researcher focused on, focused on one or two or sex worker organizations, conducted interviews and focus groups with both members of the organizations, with sex workers involved in the organizations, and also representatives from allied organizations. So the following organizations were profiled, and, I'll just, and I think we have to remember that each of these organizations operate within a very, very different socioeconomic, political, and even legal context. So um, there was no, the, the contexts were very different, the findings were remarkably the same. So in Thailand, uh, we focused on Empower. It's an organization that was established in 1985. And it estimates Empower reaches over 20,000 sex workers each year in Bangkok, in Chiang Mai, and other areas of Thailand. In terms of the context, sex work is criminalized in Thailand. And raid and rescue operations is the primary anti-trafficking measure that is used. For example, in 2015, there were at least 53 uh, entertainment place raids in Thailand, which are big media events, which involve police, heavily armed military personnel, and NGOs accompanied by members of the press. Those deemed to be trafficking victims are forcibly placed in government care for uh, up to two years before being sent home. The majority of workers who are not identified as trafficked are arrested, detained, fined, deported, and in some cases, uh, quote unquote, blacklisted so that their passports are stamped indicating that they had violated prostitution laws. Sex workers interviewed in uh, through the research with Empower indicated that the trafficking framework is only, quote, an excuse to arrest us. And all evidence indicates that trafficking has been steadily disappearing from the sex industry or in Thailand over the last 15 years, despite what you see on television. In India, uh, VAMP, 
and Sagram, which were established in the late nine, uh, 1998 uh, and 1992, respectively. In India, sex work and trafficking are conflated in law, policy, and practice. Um, the prostitution and anti-trafficking laws do not penalize the women engaged in prostitution who are considered victims, but though they, the people who pun, uh, profit from, from or exploit them are subject to criminal law. And like in Thailand, raid and rescue, repre repatriation, and compulsory rehabilitation are the primary and only anti-trafficking strategies. Mex um, and many sex workers find themselves in compulsory detention or rehabilitation centers. The third is SWET and Sasonke in South Africa. So SWET was established in Cape Town in 1994, and Sasonke uh, was established in 2003, and is the national movement of sex workers in South Africa. In South Africa, sex work is fully criminalized, but widely practiced and tolerated, and is just is considered a necessary evil. In Mexico, Brigada Caballero was the organization that was foregrounded, established also in the 1990s. And in Mexico, offering sexual services per, for pay is not a felony, but an administrative offense. So uh, sex workers who are picked up by the police are punishable with a maximum of 36 hours arrest or a fine and no criminal record. In one state, the local Congress passed a law, and where Mexico City is located actually, passed a law that allows municipalities to issue ordinances to recognize and regulate non-salaried workers. So sex, work, sex workers have been defined as non-salary workers, which is a good thing, along with street musicians, shoe cleaners, and so forth. And um, this non-salary worker category also um, allows them access to further rights, um, along with street musicians, soup cleaners, and so forth. In Spain, um, uh, Hetera, which was also established in the 1990s, and where legal, legally speaking prostitution remains in the gray area, while the buying and selling of sex is not a criminal offense, municipalities are free to create their own regulations which are used to target mainly street-based sex workers. However, soliciting and public third parties living off of the, uh, the proceeds of sex work are all criminal offenses. So it's highly criminalized, even though it's, you know, the actual buying <coughs> and selling is not a criminal offense. In Canada, I focused on Stella in Montreal, also established in 1995 and Butterfly, another organization that's based in Toronto, uh, which is the Asian and Migrant Sex Workers Support Network. And uh, Stella was also established in 1995, seemed to have been a significant year, and St uh, Butterfly was established in 2014. And if you were paying attention in 2014, the sex industry is governed in Canada by the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act which criminalize clients and third part parties and constitutes what um, was termed by the conservative, Harper's conservative government as a made in Canada and demand model. So sex workers are decriminalized, but everybody else is criminalized. You can't advertise, um, you can't work together, and those kinds of things. And finally, uh, the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective in New Zealand was the final one, established in 1987 in New Zealand where sex work was actually decriminalized in 2003. And um, unlike any other country in the world, sex workers were also directly involved in the law reform effort, um, the passage of the law in 2003. It passed only by one vote, though, in, in the legislature. So you have to keep, it was in the and it was just one vote. However, one of the things about the New Zealand law, which is very significant in the focus of the chapter, is that migrant sex, work, uh, migrant sex workers are prohibited from working in the sex industry. So the, 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 the New Zealand law had a very, very strong anti-migration uh, clause built into it. So what were some of the main themes? And I'll just uh, talk about these in turn. So, and this was across all of the studies. This was not just one, but it was sort of the, the Bobby at GatW tried to pull together some of the main things. 
The first one is um, false dichotomies. And often this false di dichotomy between being a victim and being an agent, or being victimized or having absolute free choice. And the study shows that this dichotomy really obscures the spectrum of circumstances that people that sell sex navigate. Um, and that people in the sex industry have very, very diverse experiences. So most of the sex worker organizations that were featured in this study are less concerned about labels. You know, are you a victim? You know, are you an agent of your life? Uh, just like the, the other labels, um, you know, are you a migrant? Are you trafficked? Are you smuggled? Are you asylum seeking? You know, these are all legal administrative categories. Sex worker organizations are less concerned about labels and more about concerned about the concrete circumstances that an individual is facing so that they can assist in a peer environment. And the peer-based model is very, very important for sex worker organizations and really pay, placing the person's needs at, at the center of any intervention or support measures that are provided. And sex worker organizations have been addressing situations of injustice and exploitation in the industry long, long, long before trafficking became the label to describe this. And I think that that needs to be acknowledged that sex worker organizations have been doing this work ever since they were established, since the global sex workers movement started um, in the 1970s in, in the global north and, um, and by the by the 1980s in the Global South, but this work has been ongoing, but this has never been acknowledged um, uh, in you know, a significant way in the international arena. The second theme was that according to the findings of the study, sex work is first and foremost a livelihood strategy, and sex workers articulated a desire to earn a living without interference, without discrimination, without stigma, without harassment, and without judgment. Some sex workers interviewed in, for example, Mexico, Spain, and India combine sex work with other income and generating activities. This is not their primary way of earning a living. Others, for example, in Spain, South Africa, and Thailand argued that sex work was preferable to the generally lower paid uh, jobs available to them, like domestic, and provide a way for them to support their families. And all the organizations that participated in the studies tried to ensure that sex workers can do their job in the best and safest way possible. And they also, and I think this is often uh, also unacknowledged by anti-trafficking organizations, that ever since the inception of sex workers' organizations, they have always assisted those who wish to leave the industry if they wish to do so. The third theme is stigma and criminalization, which should come as no surprise, and this was on the top list <coughs> of challenges that sex workers experience. And it was linked to a range of issues that sex workers experience. Harassment and abuse from police, clients, intimate partners, um, acquaintances and community, community members, exclusion from health and other services, social marginalization and stress, Inability to have a resume. What are you going to put on your resume? Let's say you leave the industry and what kind of work experience do you have? Lack of access to banking and housing oftentimes because you oftentimes have to prove that you have an income. Um, and obviously, you know, challenges with stigma. Uh, oh, sorry, what I meant was um, even though stigma still exists in New Zealand, the the, the discussion of stigma was less intense in the New Zealand context where decriminalization has um, been enacted. And challenging stigma is one of the primary activities of all the organizations that we study. They organize public events, they publish research, and they organize sex workers. Another significant theme was migrant sex workers, and the migrant sex workers, of course, face very specific challenges, especially in a criminalized environment. Um, as Butterfly, as Elaine Lamb, who I worked with from Butterfly in Toronto, said um, that migrant sex workers' human rights are denied because of their race, their language, their social, immigrant, and legal status. They experience stigma, marginalization, and isolation, and this increases their exposure to violence and exploitation and hinder their access to health services, protection, and justice. 
And just in the last couple of years, I think there have been four murders of migrant sex workers in, the, uh, in Ontario, in, the, in and around Toronto. All of the organizations interviewed offer services to migrant sex workers to address these issues, and this includes Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, Spain, and Mexico. So all the organizations are working with migrant sex workers. Working conditions, of course, was um, a critical thing that they talk about. So exploitative, unsafe, and unhealthy working conditions exist in sex work, as they do in other, especially labor-intensive sectors that have little or no regulations or oversight. Criminalization, by perpetuating stigma, discrimination, and social marginalization of sex workers, creates conditions where exploitation is made possible. And the sex workers were quite adamant about that. That it's not the industry itself, that it's the criminalization, stigma, and all these other factors that creates the, the conditions where uh, exploitation occurs. Some of the main issues um, included um, for indoor workers, long working hours, wage deductions or fines for breaking rules, high rents, and insufficient physical protection. And they attributed all of this to a criminalized and stigmatized nature of the industry. And one of the things that was quite interesting that they said is they also pointed out that the government and media obsession with human trafficking obscures these less sensational forms of exploitation. For example, uh, one sex worker said, it means that you ignore the ways in which you're being exploited, which are the same boring ways that anyone's exploited under capitalism. And all of the sex worker organizations interviewed developed various strategies to support sex workers to address working conditions. The next theme was ideological silencing or silencing marginalization in and exclusion, talking about us without us, so absence. Many of the participants expressed frustration with their exclusion from political participation and representation, especially when it comes to policies that concern them. Participate, participants continue to advocate for sex workers' voices to be heard, often in the face of hostility from anti-trafficking organizations. So, but there have been some small successes, um, the decriminalization of sex work in New Zealand. In Mexico, Brigada um, Javiera, organized sex workers and succeeded, as I said before, in making Mexico City government recognize sex workers at, as non-salaried workers. Human trafficking. Can I have a few more minutes, like 10 more minutes? Okay, great. So all of the sex workers interviewed acknowledges that trafficking exists. They're not saying that it doesn't exist. They say it exists. Um, but most of them interviewed perceived at trafficking in an issue that was introduced from outside the industry. It was imposed on them. It, it wasn't something that emerged uh, organically from, from people working in the industry. Um, and they, were, they felt that they were kind of compelled to understand this new language and so forth to counter the harmful effects of conflating sex work and trafficking. And um, in Spain, for example, what is interesting that they identified that uh, the concept of trafficking really emerged in 1999 after the fall of Berlin Wall and there was a noticeable increase of migrants from Eastern Europe. And it wasn't really concerned about anyone in the industry, but it was a concern about migration. In Thailand and India too, the term was perceived as something that was opposed, imposed from the US rather than something that did, was devised, devised from within the industry. So in the experience of the sex workers, it's just an excuse to address us, uh, arrest us, and I've already mentioned that. In the experience of sex workers and the organizations interviewed, the anti-trafficking machinery has not been helpful to them at all. But intervention has been, is seen as uh, stigmatizing and harmful. Sex workers are therefore suspicious of the real motives behind anti-trafficking campaigns, which they see as an excuse to eradicate prostitution, which is the source of their livelihood, an elaborate front for targeting migrants, 
and especially undocumented migrants and an elaborate front to find excuses to deport them as a way to control uh, migration. And I just wanted to read you one example that comes from Mexico. So um, in Mexico, a migrant from Honduras described how she worked in a bar that was raided by police. There were only two women there, so the police decided to brand one of them a victim of trafficking and the other the per per perpetrator, despite the fact that neither of them had been involved in trafficking. <coughs> the police ordered one woman to give money to the other, took photos, confiscated the money, and strip searched the women. The so-called perpetrator was order, uh, or, ordered to sign a confession. The so-called victim was committed to a shelter and ordered to testify against her friend. The wrongly accused perpetrator was sentenced to three years in prison. Now released, she's unable to find work because of her criminal record. So this is one example of these raid, raiding, um, rescue and raid uh, things that you know where there are really, really significant harms to people. So this this is a misapplication of the anti-trafficking laws have also included harassment by police. And thus, sex workers deeply mistrust police, and that came through very, very strong. Nine, high-profile raid and rescue operation. Most common anti-trafficking intervention. It happens in Toronto, it happens in Montreal, it happens in Chiang Mai, it happens in, um, in Mexico City. This is the most popular anti-trafficking intervention. And in Thailand and India, participants talked about how Western anti-trafficking NGOs collaborated with local law enforcement to raid brothels under the pretext of rescuing trafficking victims. In both cases, they were accompanied by the media so that everybody can see that you know, law and order is being served. So they were accompanied by the media who published sensationalized articles with dramatic pictures of the sex workers. And this happened also in Toronto in the 1990s, by the way, in the late 1990s, when there were uh, various massage parlors were raided. And then, you know, the women were just splashed all over the newspapers as if they had no relatives or family, you know, and, and it was really, really quite, quite troubling. So they pr published uh, sensationalized articles with dramatic pictures of the sex workers, thus exposing their identities uh, publicly. And there were also attempts, again, to manufacture, vic the manufacture victims to justify the raid by forcing the women to say that they were trafficked. In both cases, the raids were extremely stressful and traumatizing to the sex workers. The so-called victims were uh, detained by criminals and placed in government facilities without the uh, ability to contact their families. In both cases, it was the sex workers' organizations who stepped in to provide support for the women, informing their families that they were in jail, bringing them a change of clothes, providing translation, and keeping them informed about the case. In India, some of the women from them were yelled at and accused of, as they were accused of being slaveholders by these Western-based NGOs. Ten. Realizing rights, sex workers organizing by and with and for sex workers, and I'm almost done. Um, so the sex worker organizations clearly work in very, very different contexts, um, but they had the very same approach, or many very similar approaches to supporting sex workers. All of them respond to sex workers' needs by providing person-centered, holistic, and non-judgmental support. They meet sex workers where they're at. Most of the organizations operate on a very limited budget but offer a range of services in response to sex workers' needs, and we could say that about peers in Victoria as well. They provide a space, they do outreach, and so forth. And stories emerge also about how sex workers look out for each other in their workplaces, be it, be it in the parks of Madrid, the brothels of Sangli, or the bars of Chiang Mai. While, policies, while policymakers might feel that brothel raids and other anti-trafficking interventions are positive and will address exploitative living and working conditions, the studies show that these kinds of interventions actually disrupt the ability of sex worker organizations to provide consistent services to sex workers, including support uh, for exiting sex workers if sex workers choose to do so. So community-based interventions should be prioritized as they offer more meaningful and respectful solutions. And finally, contributions to anti-trafficking work. 
Sex workers have a very important, sex worker organizations have a very important role to play in combating exploitation and abuse in the industry, including human trafficking. In fact, sex workers organizations are the best place to interrupt such situations in the industry and in a collective and non-harmful way address the needs um, of, of sex workers. And I think that this needs to really, really be recognized by governments and the anti-trafficking movement. And if more often than not, sex workers do not turn to the local police or the mayor of the city or whomever if they need assistance, but they turn to the local sex worker organization if they're um, they experiencing uh, difficulties. So I think that the purpose then of the studies is that, um, or the conclusion of this study, and I'll just um, <coughs> go to conclusion. Oops. So sex workers, I think it's really important to point out, are adamantly opposed to human trafficking. And um, they, they, you know, they have a vested interest in having safe working conditions where forced labor and exploitation doesn't exist. So I think that that's really important. Um, but where sex workers are stigmatized and oppressed, they are understandably mistrustful of authorities they're re re reluctant to report crime and a uh, crime and to cooperate with investigations. I have to mention the EU just briefly, but when the study was finished, because they, they're funding this, so I'm gonna talk, I just say briefly the EU. In December 2017, and then I'm done, uh, GATW issued a statement in response to the EU's new priorities on trafficking in persons, which focused on stepping up the fight against organized crime networks, providing trafficked persons with better access to rights, and intensifying a coordinated response both within and outside the EU. And what was argued in this particular study was the way in which um, one of the key stakeholders in these conversations are uh, anti-trafficking organizations. And in fact, um, the EU has deliberately excluded organizations that support sex workers' rights or sex workers' organizations in any of their discussions at the EU level. So this was our attempt to uh, make an intervention, whether they heard us or not, you know, blog posts only go so far, but it was our attempt to influence the EU and hopefully all of those important people in, in, in those uh, spaces will read the report. Thank you very much. Questions? Spencer? Hi, thanks. Um, you covered topics uh, like the zone of exception, um, migrants seeking a bare life, um, and the sens sens sensationalization, sens sensationalization of trafficking in media. Um, and you talked about the, the reasons for controlling trafficking as well. So I wonder if you comment on any connections you see with that to the political theory of the state of exception, for example, and if this research goes to those realms. I'm a scientist. Tell me what that is, <laughs> and then I'll comment. Okay. Um, you mentioned, for example, the zone of exception and the sensationalization of trafficking media. Yeah. Um, it may be used to uh, nationalize some sort of um, state policy in, in terms of controlling migration. Um, are these, and I'm just curious because you mentioned the bear life, and that's that's big in uh, some of this, these readings on treating it as um, the most basic form of life, the disposable, the, yeah. the deplorable. Yeah. Curious if this research has gone to those areas as well. No, I mean, we didn't, in this research, we focused on the organization and the organizational voices and the sex workers' voices. I think it's Get W that is increasingly trying to deepen its analysis of global migration trends. And it was interesting at that particular strategic planning meeting, there were many representatives from Sri Lanka and um, Bangladesh. There were, we also had a workshop for journalists because we had this media training with journalists because we wanted them to write stories that weren't so sensationalist, you know, where it's you know, well, we've read them all, we've seen them all, they're all over the place. And and they sort of laughed and said, you know, now that Europe is suddenly 
facing a crisis, now we have a migration crisis, when there have been migration crises in various parts of Southeast Asia and so forth for a long time. So in this particular study, we didn't go into depth about into political theory and all of this. This is very sort of descriptive, you know, what we found and trying to make an intervention and who knows if anybody's going to read it, but make an intervention um, uh, just in the, in the conversation, the international global conversation. We thought by having seven countries, then maybe it'll have a little bit more traction as opposed to one, you know, oh yeah, it's India again, or yes, Thailand, you know, we're talking about Thailand again, or oh, Canada, first world, you know, can't be the same as India or Thailand. And so we tried to be as expansive as possible within the funding, the envelope that we had. The other interesting thing is, um, Funding. And in February, early, earlier this month, all of the participating organizations met in Bangkok with donors because the argument was you're pumping billions and billions and billions of dollars into anti trafficking work, which, according to this argument, is harmful, not helpful, and is actually not um, accomplishing what it seeks to accomplish. And so I think that what the argument was that sex workers organizations, even though they don't necessarily, they don't, they don't like the anti-trafficking framework at all, uh, but you know that sex workers organizations are seen as a partner in this work because they're on the ground, they know what's going on in the industry, they know if there's minors in the industry, rather than having you know militias and cops and so forth doing these raid and rescue operations and putting people in rehabilitation centers and all of that, which is you know very traumatizing. And if you see as sex workers as humans, that as rights bearing people, then I don't think that that sort of those sorts of violations can be justifiable under any you know human rights sort of framework. Thanks for your question. Yeah. I'm just wondering if the sex workers organizations uh, stand for all tenants. Um, and then you mentioned complaints of the that uh, I know very key at the meeting is also the kind of Bible terminology uh, in this book where it seems like it's very much based trafficking rather than like this uh, a shared relationship with uh, with the female and more exploited the one where they're controlling the clients and controlling the movements. Um, is there uh, a way of defining what those differences or are they just more so uh, based on sex workers together? Yeah, there was a really interesting example in India where, um, you know, they were kind of keeping an eye on what's going on and something was happening with this pimp and they chased him out of the neighborhood and the police wouldn't do anything so they just got another gangster to hook up with them and they got out and he never came back to the community. So, depending on, you know, you can call the cops and see if maybe they'll show up or they'll show up and not be particularly helpful. What this example sort of suggested is that, you know, sex workers are where, well aware if they're being controlled by a, you know, a pimp, right? And, um, but if you're working in a criminalized or stigmatized environment where you mistrust police, et cetera, et cetera, there is nobody there that's gonna help you except your fellow workers, right? And that's where the organizations come in and I think that the first place you know that a sex worker will go to is a, the local sex workers organization. They're not going to call the cops and say, "I want to get rid of this pimp." The the way in which pimps are defined under law, previously under Canadian law, a pimp could be anybody that profited off the earnings of a sex worker. So it could be a family member as well that would fall under the procuring and and the living off the avails. So um, I don't think that uh, sex workers don't use that terminology very much. They use uh, managers, or you know, they, they, they have a whole other language to distinguish. They also distinguish between bad dates and aggressors. Like they're very distinguishing. Like a bad date is somebody who kind of pushes you too much or doesn't pay or doesn't show up. And the aggressor are the violent men that where they put them up on the bad date list and say this person is totally bad news, you know, don't even. And now they're thinking, at least in Canada, about having a national sort of bad date and aggressors list across the country. Because just like sex workers are very mobile, so are perpetrators, who, the people who are, you know, violent clients. 
So the pimp thing is always a little bit, um, it's, it's an area that's quite sensitive when you talk to sex workers. Like they, they have their own kind of language and way of conceptualizing it. But um, none of the sex workers that I talked to and none of the sex workers in the, in the study um, were in, in any way under the uh, control of pimps. And, and there was just that one, one example in India where they chased him out of the neighborhood. Because they don't like them either, right? They don't like them. Because, you know, they take your earnings, you know, and you don't want to be controlled, right? So you want to be an independent worker, depending, you know, wherever you happen to be working, um, indoor, outdoor, and so forth. Yes? I was wondering if there's any um, uh, alternate strategies that either your group or some of the sex workers advocacy groups um, would be more interested in promoting in terms of anti-trafficking. Mm, I think it's very clear that, I mean, I think that the big model in the world is the DMSC in India. And the DMSC, I mean, they, they operate mainly in a brothel district, but the DMSC created, uh, and it's kind of seen as the, uh, a, you know, a major model in the world, but they, um, they establish regulatory boards in their, in the brothel districts. And what, and so it was representatives from the health department, there might be enforcement on it, and they did a lot of peer education. And so it wasn't that they were working alone, like they did have support from, and, and they have like 65,000 sex worker members. So it's a huge organization, they organize clients, they do workshops with clients to be how to be a respectful client. They had, in 2000, they had a huge carnival, um, in India that we all wanted to go to but couldn't afford it. So um, they've been very, very active, but their, their model is that sex workers and through their regulatory boards, they would go to the brothel and if there was a minor, then the min I mean, they wouldn't put them in a rehabilitation center, but they would pull the minor out and say, you know, you shouldn't be working because sex workers also don't support um, uh, minors in the industry. They can kind of understand why in some circumstances minors do trade sex for housing and all of that, so they understand that, but they have a kind of uh, moral code around that. Sex workers organizations, all of them work with minors and try and navigate systems that will support them. So in, in the DMSC model, it was sort of a, you know, if there was a minor, they'd take them out, you know, where are you from, you know, all of that, and try and uh, work with that person uh, to get them into, out, you know, out of the industry. If they encountered someone who they suspected might be, have been coerced into the brothel, they would do the same thing. They would do an intervention, but in a very, you know, non-judgmental, kind of person-centered way, you know, where are you at, you know, and, you know, all of that, you know, you, you know, how did you end up here? Oh, you were deceived and all of that. So the peer-based model is one that sex workers organizations are really, really strong about. A butterfly in Toronto and it kind of works across the country, works with migrant sex workers who are very, very isolated, like they work in hotels, right? Sometimes in massage parlors, but if you're undocumented, the only place that you can work is in a, in a hotel. And you, you're more often than not working, not working with, so extreme isolation. And so, um, so Butterfly also is very, very adamant about a peer-based model where you build the capacity of sex workers to be leaders and also to be organizers within there. So they're very, very strong kind of um, value on organizing and having peer-based models rather than calling this, relying on the state because the state is not, has not been at all helpful. In, in, or NGOs haven't been particularly helpful. Yeah. Does, that, does that influence extend sort of across the sort of migration patterns? So if they're you know, it's coming from Europe or Asia or wherever else, these women are being trafficked from, if they are being trafficked, um, are they sort of more of a reactive, they see this as a reactive uh, 
they're the terms of the mm-hmm. people of uh, the groups like Butterfly, would they react? So they would they see themselves as a group that reacts to um, the presence of someone that's been Catholic yeah. in, in a good way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they have a they have just as much of an interest to make sure that people aren't being abused and exploited in the workplace. Just like trade unionists try and fight for good working conditions for factory workers, right? Like nobody has an interest in exploitation except for the bosses, I guess. So they have a vested interest in having safe working conditions um, because they themselves don't want to be hyper exploited or abused and all of that. But I think that the conditions under which sex work currently is undertaken stigmatized, criminalized, um, you can't work with other people. I mean, if you're working alone, you know, and all of the safety strategies that sex workers on the street utilize, you know, being passing off information, all of that. No, you just push them somewhere in some dark corner, you know, and then, you know, people say, well, you deserve what you got, you know, you're engaged in sex work, you know, so, you know, why are you complaining? So I, so I think that, um, you know, and I think that the anti-trafficking groups don't get that. They see sex worker organizations as pimps and traffickers. That's what they call them. That's what I've been called. That's what every GAW person that has ever spoken in an environment where there are really strong anti-trafficking groups who think that the industry is vile, exploitative, should be eradicated, and all of that. And if sex workers say, well, that's not my experience, then they say, you're suffering from false consciousness, dear, you know, um, you don't know what you're saying. And so really not recognizing or listening to the voices of sex workers. And so with this research, what we're trying to do is hopefully make at least a little bit of an intervention. So there's acknowledgement of the hard work that the organizations do, um, whether it's outreach. I mean, in Montreal, like the outreach workers, you know, they got their backpacks with condoms and uh, safe supplies and you know, various things, you know, and they just go everywhere. They will go to uh, the workplace, they'll go anywhere where, you know, the home of the sex worker, just to make sure that they're good and safe. So uh, one of the ones that I uh, interviewed, she says like, they're this army, you know, they just go through, you know, walking through Montreal, even they go to the houses where drug is, drugs are used and they'll make sure that people have uh, safe needles and all of that. So. I mean, it's quite remarkable when you think about it, but that work is not acknowledged at all, you know, that, you know, at the level of the state or in the anti-trafficking world or, you know, people more generally. So support your local sex worker organization. Yes. Uh, is this DMSC model working all across India or in some parts no, of in, India? No, um, in Bengali, like in yeah. Calcutta, yeah. yeah. And it's huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, 65,000 members and they also have daycares for the children of sex workers. They have um, a cooperative bank for re- and the, the retired sex workers take care of the kids in the daycare and then they have this other cooperative. It's actually quite a remarkable organization and it was Dr. Jana who, um, I don't know what his background is, we always talk, call him Dr. Jana, but he sort of you know, went and, and worked with in, in that particular, in, in the brothels to, to get this organized, but it was the sex workers themselves that really um, made it happen. There's a fabulous film, it's called Tales of the Night Fairies, you can get watch it online, it's all about the DMSC. I'll show it in class. But it really, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, and I think that, you know, that their vision too was working with clients, right, the regular clients, of course, you know, to say, you know, if you're going to purchase sexual services, then be respectful and decent and use a condom. And many of the sex workers or organizations emerged in the HIV crisis, and you know they were well funded because they were seen as these anti-HIV. Um, now that HIV is in such a huge concern, you know they're all just working on a dime, right? Trying to keep the organizations um, going and also uh, you know supporting their local sex workers.
Yes, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I was wondering when, when you talk about the state um, and in terms of thinking about uh, policy, uh, policy makers and wanting your report to kind of intervene within a policy context, um, are you mainly talking about kind of uh, the national scale and supranational with the European Union and so forth? Um, so I'm wondering in terms of, um, you know, the state is not a, a unified actor, yeah, right? That, yeah. You know, in terms of thinking about city councils and kind of other, um, you know, urban, urban yeah. uh, governments that, and so do urban, kind of urban scale governments yeah. kind of engage in policy making that might be at a different level than say at the national level or supranational? Yeah. And it is the urban, is the urban perhaps a better uh, arena for thinking about yeah. more productive policy yeah. related to sex workers? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, I'm most familiar with Canada, but you know, the, the, for example, the enforcement practices in Victoria and Vancouver are completely different than what happens in Toronto, right, or Montreal. Montreal, I mean, the police are very aggressive and they are raiding massage parlors and, and um, while well, he's not the, the mayor anymore, he wanted to call, close down all the massage parlors, they're just gone. There's lots of gentrification going on in Montreal. The old red lights district is being sort of converted in some new, I don't know, Silicon Valley or something. So gentrification is also a significant. So Montreal is um, is a tough place, especially you know the indoor workers. I mean, the the regulation of the sex industry has in Canada at least focused mainly on uh, on street sex workers. You know, indoor workers they're invisible. Nobody knows what they're doing. Um, even though the indoor workers are really nervous under the new legislation, in Toronto also very wanting to root out all those migrant sex workers and um, lots of raids of massage parlors as well. Vancouver used to do raids. Uh, 2006, uh, they did a huge raid, uh, I think of 18 massage parlors. You know, we are gonna find the trafficking victims. Not one to be found. Um, and then, you know, and then, you know, all this trauma, you know, and nobody got their phones and the money confiscated, the, you know, they were all really upset, you know, and they, oh yeah, then they were taken to the police station, handcuffed, not a single traffic person. And, you know, the SWAN has been working in the massage parlors for years. They know exactly what, you know, they do outreach in the massage parlors. Anyways, but then the line was, because this was actually a botched operation because there were like 110, you know, border enforcement and RCMP, you know, like they were just like, this is a huge operation. So I went to a conference shortly after and I just sort of said, wow, that was a botched operation. And they said, oh, well, there must have been a leak and those massage parlor owners in Vancouver switched the women and all the traffic women were in the basement. And I said, are you kidding me? That's the only thing that you can come up with, you know, just apologize, like you don't know what you're doing. Anyways, so, um, but in Victoria and Vancouver, in Vancouver the policing practices, although not perfect, partly because of the Picton case and the uh, Vancouver Police Department, you know, had people threw shade on them big time, you know, that they botched the whole Picton. So they kind of cleaned house and they, they were working very closely with some of the downtown east side organizations, PACE, Pivot Legal Society is also a really important organization, WISH and so forth, and said we have to change the policing practices, like you cannot be the enemy of the sex workers because if you're the enemy of the sex workers, we're going to have another victim case in no time. So, um, so they're, you know, they, but, you know, even when you talk to sex workers, they just say they still, you know, they're cowboys, you know, like they, you know, they just kind of don't get it, you know, the vice cops and all of that, like they just, they don't quite get it, but it's better. And in Victoria, I think that peers, you know, they're developing a good relationship with the local police force, you know, that they're not harassing uh, on street sex workers and they're not really enforcing the new law. In the state. So I think that the urban setting is really, really important and um, it really depends on uh, the particular urban landscape. In, in Montreal, the key thing is gentrification and the, la the last mayor, whose name escapes me at the moment, like he was really adamant, like he wanted to clean up his city, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what the new mayor is going to do. And in Toronto, it's, it's pretty bad.
Okay, I think we need to cut it off there, but okay. thank you so much. Thank you.